Gillanon is a freaking psychopath. All right, so we don't know it was her, but it was probably her. So I was hoping to avoid spoilers for most of these Deventer Knight stories, but there's no avoiding it here. So, spoilers for the third story in the book, Horrors of Hormak. So, two Grey Wardens are going through a forest in Navarra. They are on their way to the last known location of another group of Wardens that has gone missing. One is a mage who has only been in the Order for about two years. The other is a veteran who has been in the Order for about 21 years. One of the men that went missing is the former lover of the veteran. While walking through the forest, they start smelling the distinct smell of brine and seawater, despite being very far away from any ocean. They start feeling something weird. They can't quite place what it is, but it makes them uneasy. It even frightens the horses, which were specifically bred and trained to not be fearful. One of the horses runs off and gets eaten whole. Nearby, there's a mound of dirt that looks like it was recently disturbed. So we're left to infer something came up from the ground and swallowed up the horse. Well, when the veteran comes back after finding that, he finds his companion sitting next to another warden who has quite clearly uh, witnessed something traumatic. For starters, she clawed out her own eyes. She talks about how her group encountered something besides Darkspawn, something created, something disturbing. The woman gets spooked and tries to run off, so the mage casts a sleeping spell on her. They tie her up and make camp for the night. During his watch, the veteran notices the frightened woman mumbling something, repeating something incomprehensible. When he gets closer to her, she stops. He backs off, she starts again. After his watch, the mage takes over. Eventually, she goes to get more wood for the fire, and the frightened woman chews through her ropes and runs off. The veteran wakes up and finds a gray liquid leading from the woman's tent through the forest. He follows and discovered she didn't just chew through the ropes, but through her wrists. Tendons and veins were poking out. It was gross. Then she vomits up the gray liquid, more than should have been possible to contain in a human body. Well, frightened woman dies, mage and veteran continue on. They exit the forest, and the smell of brine and seawater gets even heavier. I think the story uses the word overpowering every time they enter a new area and the smell gets stronger. I thought that was kind of funny. They finally find the warden camp smeared with blood. But no bodies. They later find an entrance to the deep roads. They go down and enter the dwarven tag of Hormak. They know because there is a sign that says Hormak. They encounter Darkspawn, except they are weird. There is an emissary with the wings of a bat, a herlock with the tail of a scorpion, and a snake for an arm. They are weird. In addition, they move more strategically than Darkspawn normally would. Well, the Wardens get injured, but they do defeat the Darkspawn. They continue, find some lyrium charges, and a secret door. It's worth noting that they go out of their way to mention that Dumont did a lot of damage to this area during the first blight. It's interesting that they mention Dumont specifically doing a lot of damage around this tag. Well, they go through the secret door, and the tunnel leads to some distinctly elven architecture. They find paintings on the wall of an elven priestess, a monster, and a supplicant. As the paintings go further down, the priestess' smile gets bigger and the monster and supplicant change slightly. Further in, they find a wall of bas reliefs. The top row depicts elves showing reverence to kings and queens. The middle row depicts sickness being drawn out of elves by priests. And the bottom row shows elves traveling in very fancy aravels being drawn by beautiful Hala to this very distinct mountain they are under now. But then the images seem to shift. The ones praising their leaders now seem to be pleading for mercy, while the leaders themselves looked on with disdain. The ones drawing sickness out of victims are now pushing sickness into them, and the fancy aravels look more like prison ships or slave transports being pulled by twisted, almost insectile hala. Through the room, the symbol of hala horns repeated itself, which some have pointed out kind of look like DNA strands. 
Finally, the two go through a door and find a room filled with piles of grotesque parts and monstrous hybrid creatures. For example, there was a snake's giant maw on top of Hala's neck walking on Varterel's legs. And a giant spider, except instead of eyes, it has snakes coming out of its face. Because of course spiders and snakes aren't creepy enough on their own. Better smash them together. In the center of the room was a pool filled with that gray liquid, and hanging over it was a giant lyrium thing that gives off some green and yellow light. They watch a herlock wander over and just gently touch the pool of liquid, then immediately become covered in it, and a cocoon forms around it, glowing with some kind of green light. Then there's a flash of light, the cocoon breaks, and there's the herlock, top half, coming off the body of a big drake. Finally, the wardens decide to leave, but the mage trips due to her injuries, and alerts all the creatures in the room, including a giant centipede centaur. The human part was, of course, the veteran's former lover, twisted and gross, but still clearly him. He was fighting against a more evil force inside him, compelling him to attack. He talked about how the gray stuff works differently for them, and they needed it inside instead of just touching it. He says to destroy the place, bury it all, and she cannot have it. He refuses to answer who she is. He suggests blowing up the lyrium, then attacks. He gets stabbed in the giant centipede portion of his body, and gray liquid comes out. Long story short, the mage sacrifices herself to blow up the lyrium, causing the room to cave in. But the giant centipede centaur man survives and chases the veteran through the temple, up the tunnel, and into the tag, where the veteran spots the lyrium charges rigs them to blow, runs away after igniting them, and they explode just as the monster catches up. Veteran makes it outside, watches the hill come down in on itself, and hears no more from the creature. Then he remembers something. The boss reliefs didn't just show the transports going to one mountain, but twelve. So we don't know it was Gilanon, but with the creatures and the magics involved in the distinctly elven temple, showing leaders abusing their subjects, with the repeating symbols of holohorns. Even if Gilanon wasn't directly responsible for this, she was totally involved in some way. Maybe she was just worshipped by the people there, but didn't actually tell them what to do. But even in that scenario, she did nothing to stop it, so she must have approved, or at least didn't object. Gelderthalen presented a theory that the twelve sites the Bas Relief showed were the twelve great dwarven tigs. She suggests there may have been one beneath Orzammar that Sandal found, but it was destroyed, or at least sealed. I like the theory, but there's not much to go on. Now, of course, the big thing I need to talk about here is the Grey Liquid, and what force was influencing these creatures. I get the feeling it is similar to the Well of Sorrows. The Frightened Woman says they taught us. They built it for her. They wait for her. I am free. I paid the price. Then the veteran's lover said, Stop them. Stop us. They could just be talking about the monsters themselves, but as shown with Loverboy and the Darkspawn, they seem to have some sort of compulsion, if not outright control. That sounds way too similar to the effects of the Well of Sorrows. Will passed on through the pool. And they all serve and wait for a her. I believe it to be Gilanon. Some have suggested the sidereal magisters as making use of such pools, and it is possible, but the temple is definitely elven, and the artwork depicts the cruelty that correlates to Solus's claims about the Evanurus. The elves were definitely responsible for the place and the monsters there, regardless of whether anyone else ever made use of it. Malvernus is another suspect, but there's not much to go on. He was on my mind for a good bit of the story. It is entirely possible he, or she, played a role in these places. Now let's talk about Frightened Woman and the things she says. She escaped. She said she is free and that she paid the price. She had the gray liquid in her body. 
but she didn't turn like Loverboy. She paid the price to be free, but she wasn't really. The Hurtlock got immediately covered from touching it, and turned very quickly. Loverboy said it works differently for, quote, us. That may mean Grey Wardens, but why them and not Darkspawn? I'm left to assume it must mean people with souls, since normal Darkspawn don't have them. But that means they must have felt a compulsion to drink. They wouldn't have done that of their own free will. Unless... Maybe they fought a creature that bled the stuff, and that blood got in their mouth? Or maybe a creature spit the stuff into their face as though it was venom or something? Those are the only options I can think of. Maybe one of them was infected and somehow forced the others to drink? Frightened Woman says three of them died, so there is that. But I am confused as to how this thing works. I don't think I'm going to get an answer, but I at least want to lay out what we know. Piles of severed body parts were all over the room with the pool. Body parts had been grafted from some creatures onto others like the hollow with the snake's mouth and varteral legs, and the spider with snakes for eyes. The herlock's upper body ended up attached to the bottom part of a drake. But where did the drake body come from? Did the cocoon and water manufacture it in a few seconds? Like it absorbed a drake in the past and remembers the DNA configuration? If so, how does it decide what body parts go on what creature? And why have all the severed body parts laying around the room? Were they ones that proved incompatible with the things the fluid tried to put them on? I mean, if you can combine a giant centipede with a human and a spider with snakes, I find it hard to imagine there's anything that isn't compatible. Maybe it's parts the fluid created, but got left over because it couldn't find a place to attach it. Loverboy says two halves, two holes, trying to be two ones. But he remained himself temporarily, and it hates that. That's for him specifically, since other creatures are combinations of more than two. So, two halves, two holes, trying to be two ones. So I think both creatures have a will that are trying to exert control on the body. That's what it sounds like, at least in his case. So, I mean, I guess that's that. So to recap, nope, 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 nope. And also, hell yes. More weird, disturbing things. Less elven things, but I like weird horror just thrown in there. So yeah, uh, Gilanon was probably at least partially responsible for what was going on in this place. There are likely 11 other sites that may be beneath Dwarven Tigs. It's worth remembering that the Dwarves of Hormok knew about this place, and had a secret door that led straight there. I have to wonder why they didn't destroy it themselves. Even Centipede Loverboy said it was sealed for a reason, though clearly not well enough. Actually, it stands to reason that treasure hunters or something went down there and were all turned or killed. But how did the Darkspawn get down there? Also, these creatures, at least the non-blighted ones, do they not need food anymore? If they were trapped in here, how did they survive? I mean, you had the worm thing that ate the horse, so at least one that roams beneath the forest. Does it bring back food for the others? Is the reason it doesn't attack towns because it's still waiting for the mysterious her to return? Or does the gray fluid kind of sustain them magically forever? One way or another, there is a Thresher Maw thing swimming around beneath a Navarran forest that no one knows about. Somehow. Not a criticism, I just wonder how intelligent it is to keep itself secret and how far it travels to hunt. Like, if a large hunting party came in, it wouldn't mess with them. And I guess the weird feeling the Wardens had kept others away as well? I don't know, I'm confused guys, I'm just rambling at this point. Be sure to let me know your theories as to why all this craziness has remained a secret. Truthfully, there could be any number of reasons, ranging from mundane to magical. The bigger question is how much the Dwarves know about this stuff. So that's quite a bit, 
But uh, here's where I'll wrap things up. So that's it for now, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to comment and like, and remember, tala nadas.